All right, we're live. So the topic today, this week, is kind of related to our internal challenge of the week. The title is Finding the Flow in Everyday Life. And this is really what our practice is for. It is not just about what happens on the mat. This is great. If you find the flow and you are able to practice as a moving meditation, that is, of course, wonderful. But if it stays here and it doesn't leave the dojo, and as soon as you walk out the door, you're back to being the same jerk that you were before class, it's, it's mostly pointless. You want to get something out of it for your everyday life, right? So the challenge this week was to take the same kind of mindset and there are lots of mindsets that we practice, being a partner rather than an opponent, right? Um, being, you know, not just caring about winning, uh, all, all the different things that we talk about. But the specific idea this week is take the, the same kind of approach that you have towards getting better at technique and take that into some other kind of everyday activity. And so this could be things like... Uh, how much are you practicing doing it, right? It could be something like, how mindful am I or focused and not allowing myself to be distracted. It could be choosing a specific detail and then working on it until I actually make some concrete progress, right? So the example that I've been giving is brushing your teeth and it could be anything, but brushing your teeth is, for me, one of the first things that I started to do this with. Uh, I brush my teeth every day. I have brushed my teeth every day for a very long time. I'll tell you that I did not go to the dentist for a very long time once. This is kind of an aside, but I had zero cavities for, the, for my whole life until one day I went to the dentist and I had two cavities in the same tooth, and he drilled so deep that I ended up having to get a, uh, the, the nerve got infected and they didn't let me come back in to see the dentist until it was too late. I had to get a root canal. And if you have ever had a root canal, you will understand why I did not go back to the dentist for 12 years. <laughs> and I came back to the dentist after being gone for 12 years. Now this is not a normal 12 years. This is 12 years while I was practicing martial arts, very mindfully brushing my teeth and flossing semi-regularly. And I came back to the dentist after 12 years with zero cavities. Now I'm not telling you that if you don't go to the dentist that everything's gonna be fine, you should probably go to the dentist. But uh, I kind of digress. If you uh, are applying the same kind of mindset that you have in practice to brushing your teeth, for example, uh, and I asked the kids, because I gave the same example in the kids class, and I'm like, what are you doing different? And they all say, brushing my teeth, sir. And I'm like, well, how are you doing it differently? And they, they're like, oh, I'm making sure that I'm brushing my teeth for two full minutes. I set a timer and I brush until the two minutes are done. I ask another kid, what are you doing? I'm making sure I get every single tooth, sir. And that's all great. That's stuff that I did when I started to brush my teeth. The Kung Fu mindset, the martial artist mindset for brushing your teeth means that you are just doing whatever you can do fully, right? You're paying attention to the little details. You're being mindful. You're totally in the present. Uh, a lot of people think that Kung Fu means fighting. They're like Kung Fu obviously means like punches and kicks or it means self-defense. That's not what it means. Kung Fu loosely translates to achievement through effort or wisdom through skill. It's not fighting specific. It's having some kind of uh, improvement through the effort that you're putting into it. And it's that mindset that means that you can have Kung Fu in brushing your teeth. You can have Kung Fu in washing the dishes or anything else that you do. And this is, this is the mindset of our practice. So my definition of a martial artist, I stole from my Sifu's definition, and he probably stole it from somebody else, but it is somebody who takes the lessons of our practice into everyday life. If you're only doing it here, you're not a martial artist. You're learning martial arts techniques, and you could be learning how to defend yourself and all that, but you're not actually a martial artist until it goes out into everyday life. And that's the transformation that we go through when we decide, I'm going to do other stuff like I do martial arts. And... There are so many different ways that this could show up. Uh, I asked the students in class earlier today, 
who had taken on this challenge this week. And in one of the classes, one of our very best students raised her hand all the way from Paris. And I asked Tanya what she was doing. And she said, photography, sir. And I know she is a very talented photographer. And uh, I've seen some of her work and it's really beautiful, but you can tell she really pours herself into it. And she sent me this, this more detailed answer for how she is taking like the martial artist mindset into her photography. So I asked her and she said, I could read this to you. So she says, approaching martial, or sorry, approaching photography like martial arts. Even my professor during that photo class I took in LA on understanding how I felt about School of Martial Arts told me directly that I'd need to approach photography the same way. So this is great. If you find a photography teacher who tells you that you should do photography like martial arts, then you got, you got a great teacher. <laughs> Uh, these are the ways that immediately come to mind. One, consistency. Do something around it, if not necessarily taking a photo, every single day. And this is huge, right? Consistency with your practice. If you only practice like once every once in a while, you're not going to get great at it. You got to come at least a couple times a day. But best is if you can do something every day with your practice. If you're trying to get great at photography. You want to do something every day. Of course, taking pictures every day will make you better at photography. Two, beginner's mind. It's okay to not know what I'm doing. Approach it with curiosity, not fear. That is so massive. I was kind of talking about this at the end of jujitsu class, being curious. Your partner starts to do something to you. And instead of being afraid of it and trying to stop it, you just, you get curious about what they're doing. And this kind of invites you into a state of mind that is like play and if you're going to be an artist with photography, with martial arts, or with anything else, and you can be an artist with brushing your teeth, you got to be curious about it. Rather than being stuck doing it a certain way, rather than being stuck like being afraid to mess up, just play with it and enjoy it. That's what the beginner's mind is all about. Uh, three, appreciate and show that appreciation for my mentors and also recognize I can learn from everyone. This is huge. I mean, of course, appreciating your teachers and mentors, even your senior students, all that is wonderful. But knowing that you can learn from anybody is so huge. Uh, we say in martial arts, the first way of becoming martial, great at martial arts is patience, right? But the first real way is find a great teacher. And I don't say that all the time to the beginners because I don't want to sound like I'm congratulating myself. But if you're going to get great at anything, especially something that is complex and something that is really involved, you got to have a great teacher. You shouldn't be making this stuff up. The internet is not a great teacher. You want to find somebody who is truly like knowledgeable and great at expressing that and communicating it. But also, if you are a really wonderful student, you can make anybody a great teacher. Uh, and this is kind of what it means to be a martial artist is to be able to learn from anybody, learn from not only the senior students and the people teaching class, but learn from the people who you know more than because they might do something that is actually better than what you're doing, but more likely they'll do something that makes you think like, wait a minute, there's actually some things for me to get out of this, whether it's a defense or a way of just doing things slightly differently, learn from everybody, learn from Learn from the bugs on the ground, learn from the clouds in the sky, like everything is our greatest teacher if we have that kind of mindset. Uh, four from Tanya's answer is find the flow. And that's all she wrote. So I'm just going to extrapolate on that because that is really what we're talking about with this whole talk. Finding the flow is, uh, again, about not being stuck, right? Our practice and especially including our meditation practice is a study of letting go. When we get stuck, that is ego, that is attachment, and is very natural. That is what your ego wants to do is be attached. We have to be able to let it go because very rarely will things in practice and just as rarely will things in life go exactly the way that we have in mind. So my Sifu always says, you don't judge success by how well you're able to do plan A. Instead, you want to judge success by how smoothly and quickly you can transition to plan B and then plan C and then as many plans as you need to go. Because if you get stuck, 
Plan A works or it doesn't and you're done. If you flow, you're not attached. You're able to take the next and the next and the next opportunity. In meditation, you sit and you're going to have a thought that you're attached to. This is what's going to happen in every single meditation. And then your opportunity is to either be stuck on that thought or let it go. Usually what happens is when people recognize that they had a thought, instead of letting it go and moving on to the breath, they then move on to the next train of thought, which naturally comes from recognizing you're, you're messing up and you start beating yourself up for messing up. That is still being attached to that thought, right? You're resisting and that's what attachment feels like. It feels like work. It doesn't feel fun. So meditation, I mean, I don't want you having so much fun that you're just sitting there laughing, but it should feel light. When you recognize a thought, you let it go like it never happened. Uh, a good analogy for this is if you ever play with a child and it's got something, maybe it's holding on to your finger like this, and then you hand it a wooden block, which to a child, a wooden block is the most interesting thing on the planet. And it's like, it lets go of your finger like you never existed and the block is its whole world now. This is what we wanna be like in our meditation and in our practice, right? In this moment, this moment here is our whole world. We're not stuck on the thought that we just had. So there are a couple of different ways to do that, but that is really our goal. The next one is no expectation to be amazing in anyone else's eyes, but I do want to find the voice of the style that feels true to me and what I want to improve. So this is what we should find in our own practice. Of course, you're not meant to be exactly the same as anybody else. Uh, you are meant to learn the technique, but then eventually be able to move beyond that. I'm actually going to take a moment here to talk about this other uh, concept. And I've talked about it a couple of times in the past. There's this idea in Japanese uh, martial arts, but that also applies to everyday life. It's shu ha ri. Shu is we practice exactly the way that we are shown, right? So you are becoming a technician by doing the technique perfectly. That is the first stage. The first stage ends when your technique is perfect, okay? That's a long time. The next stage is when we have mastered doing that technique that way. And then we start to kind of open up and allow ourselves to flow with it. This is a little bit of individual expression, a little bit of artistic license. You can't skip straight to that because you're missing the principles and you're missing the way that things work. This in photography would be like, I don't have to learn how to use the camera. I'm just going to go like kind of wing it and see how it goes. And you're pressing the wrong button and it's not taking any pictures. You're pointing the camera, the wrong, you're pointing the camera directly at the sun. You're like, how come these pictures all suck? Cause you never learned the principles behind how it works. That's what you're doing with your body. Your body is the thing that you are creating art with. You have to learn how your body works, how these you know, mechanics work and how your partner's body works with you. So this is the first stage, but the second stage is when we're able to start to become a little bit more individualized in the way that our technique works. I know what works for me is not exactly the way that it works for anybody else. And then, so that was ha. Re is when you are just completely letting go of trying to get the technique right and you are just flowing in the moment. This flow state comes after mastery of the basics, after being able to find your kind of individual, uh, individual expression. And then you completely let go of the idea of winning or getting it right. And in the moment, it happens. It happens without you being there, without you trying to do it. And this is key. If you are there, you are in the way. You cannot do martial arts. You cannot flow. You cannot be a brilliant photographer because you is very small and incapable of doing most things. But when you allow yourself to disappear and you connect to your highest self, your biggest self is capable of incredible things. Uh, 
that is the you that is not stuck. That's the you that is not attached to doing things the same way that I've always done it, right? That is when you are going to be able to really flow in practice and in life. Uh, so there are going to be many things in your life that you recognize. I'm kind of stuck in this shoe stage. I'm, pra- I'm trying to practice and like get it right. And you're still not there. Great. Then that's what you're learning how to do. But like if we take photography as an example, once you really know how to take the pictures, then you want to allow yourself to find your own style. And then eventually you want to just flow and just, you know, let that art flow through you. Okay. We're on to seek to hone the self-editing eye and then choosing what I want to share because it speaks to how I think and see, uh, like how we choose to partner in class. So I'll I'll stick with this first part, seek to hone the self-editing eye. We have to sometimes return to being, as I say, like being a scientist. We're trying to return sometimes to hone the technique and see exactly how it should be. And the longer you practice, the better able you should be to fix your technique. This can happen within that first stage, but also it can happen within the other stages as you're seeing a a better way to do it. And that should happen in art as well. Seven was, I want it to be a natural extension of who and how I am. So if you are... Again, this is kind of related to that that second and third stage of mastery. But if you are trying to, if it's a if it's a natural extension of who and how I am, it, this is kind of another way of saying that it's flowing through you. If it feels natural, it's not like you're trying to fake something else, right? In practice, you're not trying to pretend that you are somebody else or that you are perfect at a technique. You're not trying to imagine that you're perfect. You're just allowing it to happen. So when our practice becomes just a natural extension of who we are, it's kind of also like we're folding ourselves into our practice. Like we are also a natural extension of practice. It has this kind of cycle that feeds on itself. And this is huge because if we can start to see things in everyday life as an extension of our practice, then this is kind of like a shortcut to getting into that state of flow, to having this kind of mindset for our practice. So if we are able to flow in the dojo, but then you leave class and you find yourself driving home and it's like, I'm stuck. I drive the same way home every single day or Every time I find myself behind a car that's going slightly slower than I am, I honk my horn or I cut them off or whatever. Like you don't want the way that you have always done things to remain the way that you have always done things, right? Be curious and just imagine you go to sit in your car and at some point you'll recognize I'm stuck. I'm doing this the same way that I always do it. How would I do this? How would I take this on if it was happening in the dojo. Now, I don't want to be in the car with most of you. I'm not going to be there yelling at you, telling you the way to drive. But you could, in your imagination, imagine what if Sifu was right here and he saw the way that I was doing this. Would he be disappointed and how mindful I am not about the way that I'm driving? Uh, What would he be, you know, suggesting to me to fix about this? That's great. I did that with my Sifu all the time. My Sifu has been with me in the weirdest situations through life. And I love to think like, what would he tell me to do right now? Or I think more usefully for me is if he was there kind of looking at me right now, how would I change the way that I'm doing this to make it more of like a natural extension of my practice? And this is a great shortcut, again, to just inviting the, the mindset of practice into everyday life. If we find ourselves kind of getting stuck and doing things the same way, you want to use little shortcuts like that, little things that kind of trigger a new way of thinking, a new way of being. So I know that if you are like me, when you're on the mats, you are your best self. You're kind of like putting your best foot forward. You are really trying to be mindful and present. You're trying to be the best possible partner. All of that is great. And you are really trying to flow. 
So flow can only happen in the present moment. If we are able to take that outside of the dojo into everyday life, and we just put ourselves in that kind of flow mindset of like, if I'm doing this in the dojo, what does this feel like? That's great. So when we sit to meditate, we'll do that in a minute. Recognize when you get stuck. And instead of beating yourself up because you got attached to a thought, let it go. A very simple, very powerful way of doing this is just to say the word thought in your mind. That allows you to let go of the thought without any kind of judgment, self-judgment. And this is kind of what happens when we get stuck is we are judging ourselves. We're like, you messed up. You're supposed to not be thinking at all. You're supposed to be like the Buddha and just have no thought to be perfect. Uh, you just let that go by saying thoughts. There's no judgment in that. It's a logistical act. It is a recognition of what is not a judgment. You're not coloring it. You're not turning it into anything else. And this is really important because that allows us to come right back to the present rather than being stuck in what just happened. So try that tonight. When you sit and you recognize a thought, just say in your mind, thought, let it go, come back to the next breath. And in this breath, nothing else matters. This breath is like that wooden block for a child. This breath, when you feel yourself breathing in, it's like you're inhaling the entire universe. It's like you're inhaling lifetimes and you want to be able to stretch that breath out as much as possible in your mind by just being totally absorbed by it like nothing else exists. Sit comfortably. So quick review of posture. There are many ways that you can sit in meditation. I like to sit in seiza, but sitting cross-legged is wonderful if you are flexible enough in the hips and the knees to make that work. Just make sure that your knees are not sticking up above your hips because then your legs are going to fall asleep. Your hands are upturned at the hips. They can be together. They can be separate. If you are sitting cross-legged with your knees more even, then your hands might go on your knees, but you don't want to be slouching like this. So keeping your hands here helps you to keep a good posture. Your shoulders are rolled back and relaxed, and your chin is parallel to the ground. Pull, close eyes. So your spine is straight, your eyes are closed and slightly upturned to the point between the eyebrows. So the different positions that you could take with your eyes, this one is great for associating with a higher state of consciousness. This helps you to not fall asleep and helps you to kind of stay out of that everyday mindset. If your eyes are forward, you're kind of in a regular everyday consciousness. If your eyes are down, you're in more of a sleep consciousness. But the eyes raised up, not crossed, because we don't want to get a headache. But just looking up, and you can imagine like you're looking at the space between your eyebrows. You can also imagine that you're looking like in or focus your, focusing your attention on the physical space in the front of your brain where there's no actual physical sensation that will help you to let go of the physical sensation in your body, which is important. If you're stuck feeling the aches and pains or the itches, you're going to have a very difficult time being in the present. So instead, raise the eyes up relax, watch the breath, let go of all thoughts, worries, and cares. Be here now. When your mind wanders and you recognize a thought, just label it thought, let it go, return back to the breath as many times as it takes. Mm-hmm. 